Thank you so much for uh, Swimming to the Other Side by Emma's Revolution. A great song uh, for Samhain about swimming to the other side. And this time of the veil is most permeable. A great song for us to have this morning. So thank you to everybody who went and uh, helped us learn that and sing that this morning. The spiritual formation we receive from our families of origin is deep and it's powerful. Family forms us for good or for ill as family environment and history can be both healthy and harmful and not infrequently a little of both. My only aunt, my mom's sister, lives now in an Alzheimer's memory unit in West Hartford. Her memory comes and goes at best, except when she is going through old photos and mementos. While going through old photos, she will remember everyone in the pictures and where it was taken, if she originally knew. So, going through photos with her a couple months ago, with her and my mom, found a photograph of my great uncle Tony, Anton Carlos. That was the photograph we found. I was captivated by this photo of this ancestor because other than my grandparents' wedding picture, I had never seen any other image of him as a young man. By the time I was born in 1966, he had already had throat cancer. By the time I was old enough to have memory of him, he had survived a stroke. So the only person I knew was a bit of a hunched over shuffling guy who basically always wore the same clothes, you know, gray chinos, forest green jacket, same hat, you know, white t-shirt every day, right? And because of the stroke and the throat cancer, all he ever said, the only words I ever heard him say my entire life were, we say, we say, <coughs> we say. It became, you know, a thing. It was cute, it was funny, it was just him. My brother and my cousins and I, you know, that was Uncle Tony. We say, we say. We were amazed at my grandparents and our parents' ability to know exactly what he meant by this. All we heard was, what you say, but my grandmother knew it meant, please get me some more coffee, or I'd like to see the sports page, or can we bring some iced tea out to have with this dinner. They knew whatever he was saying, and all he said was, <coughs> we say. When I got older, I realized they probably put together a lot of things from context and having known him a long time. But as a child, it seemed magical. Like, how did my grandparents know exactly what he meant? <laughs> so, five years ago, my brother and my sister-in-law had their son, Calvin, named after the comic book character. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> but... At his birth, I became Uncle Tony, Tony we say. <laughs> <laughs> and it became a great family joke all over again. But then, a couple months ago, I found this photograph. And Uncle Tony wasn't just a little weasened old man who croaked, what do you say? He was young and vital. And that was taken in Belgium in 1943. And he made it back. But all of a sudden, my whole perception and identity of my ancestor, and therefore of myself, flipped on a dime. All of a sudden, he was a young, vital person as well as an old man. And I realized that I needed to make Uncle Tony not just a fun guy who says, what do you say? 
but someone who is there in all the ways you need to be there for your children and your nephews and your nieces and all your loved ones. And it was a powerful little lesson for me, seeing that picture that day, and thinking about all of that. So all of a sudden, I went from this supposition that I knew how to sing my family song to thinking of it all over again and rethinking what my verse would be as the powerful play went on. It might not be as hoarse and garbled all the time anymore in some ways. Even when family is difficult or hard or painful or just different, it is family and we cannot escape it. It is always part of us one way or another. And in many ways we return to it even though we don't have to be captive to it. Bruce Springsteen's biographer David Marsh says that the characters who populate Bruce Springsteen's songs share an interesting quality in that many of them want to rebel against the values they've inherited while at the same time seeking them as a refuge. And I've always thought that was a really great way to express what lots of us take from our family. In many ways, there's something we rebel against from where we come from or what we were taught. I imagine most of us wouldn't be in this room this morning <laughs> if that wasn't the case. And yet, there's something in us that seeks some of those things we were taught as a refuge of safety and security in a crazy, ever-changing, sometimes violent, sometimes really mixed up world. For example, we may have run away from those values we inherited about certain things about church or religion. And yet here we are. Because there's something about the big questions of life and community and love. Don't you love the way Robin Williams says love, reciting that piece right there? It's one of my favorite bits he ever did, the way he said love in, in that little segment. Right? And so, as we come here knowing that we've come from a family and we belong to a family of faith, we are people who continue those traditions. We will add to the story. And so the question we ask ourselves this time of year is, what will your verse be? powerful play goes on and you will, you do contribute a verse. Whether you think of it that way or not, that is what you've done and what you are doing right now. <clears throat> but have you thought about what the verse will be? I went through an experience that made me think a lot about what my verse will be in my family. And really caught me off guard. I thought I had that role all figured out. And that song, all learned. And then it starts to become like jazz, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> A little more improvisation is going to be required. <laughs> and here you are, maybe having come from another tradition of religion or spirituality, but now you're here part of this one, Unitarian Universalism. And what will your verse be in this faith tradition? Because this is a powerful play that has gone on a very long time as well. And you, by being here, are contributing a verse. <clears throat> Let's take a look at what some others have contributed to get us thinking about what we might be able to do. William Ellery Channing, in 1819, preached a sermon called Unitarian Christianity. At the time, Unitarianism as such did not quite yet exist. But after that sermon, it did, because what he did in that sermon at the ordination of Jared Sparks in Baltimore was take something people were making fun of, Unitarianism, and claim it as a title, you know? People were making fun of the Unitarians, the people who denied the doctrine of the Trinity, who thought Jesus was not quite as divine as the Trinitarian inherited theology would say. And they would make fun of people like Channing, oh, the Unitarians. 
And so in this sermon, Cheney says, yes, we're Unitarians. Absolutely. Let's print t-shirts. <laughs> or he would have if printing t-shirts had been a thing in 1819. I'm sure he would have. Actually, he probably wouldn't have, but somebody else would have. <laughs> but he took up this badge of freer thinking ways to interpret the Christian tradition he had inherited. And he contributed his verse. That yes, we are Unitarian. We believe everything has one source it comes from and returns to. And in the sermon, he lays out the biblical argument that the Trinity is not biblical and that it doesn't make rational, philosophical sense. He does a great job. But that's his verse. That's the one he's most known for. In a sense, that started what we now know as Unitarianism in America. Then there's Hosea Ballou, character from our skit this morning. Hosea was a universalist. And in the early 1800s, he published something called a treatise on atonement that makes the argument that Jesus dying for our sins is kind of ridiculous theology. He says, isn't it strange and a bit irrational that a God of love only loves us if some other person is tortured to death? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And he spent a lot of time preaching about this and making the arguments that that really doesn't make a lot of sense. And neither does this God of love punishing people for eternity. And why would a perfect being of love punish imperfect mortal things for not being perfect? None of it makes any sense. And this was his universalism, that God saves everybody. That a God who punishes and condemns makes no rational sense. And people would tell him, but you must love God as God is, not as you want him to be. And he gave a famous argument from an orange. And he said, and this is him, I know it is frequently contended that we ought to love God for what God is and not for what we receive from him, that we ought to love holiness for holiness's sake and not for any advantage such a principle is to us. This is what I have been told, but what I never could see any reason for or propriety in. I am asked if I love an orange, for example. I answer I never tasted one, but I am told I must love the orange for what it is. Now I ask, is it possible for me either to like or dislike the orange in reality, never having tasted it? Well, I taste of it, and I like it. Do you like it, my friend says. Yes, I reply, its flavor is exquisitely agreeable. But that will not do, says my friend. You must love the orange because it is the orange. And he went on to say, you know, this is some of how the arguments about how you must love and obey God just because God didn't really make sense to him. And that was part of the verse he contributed to this Unitarian Universalist story. And others of our ancestors in this tradition have done some incredible verse contributing. We contributed the verse of American religious humanism to American religion. We held aloft banners for the suffragists and the abolitionists. We're at the forefront of LGBTQ rights and civil rights and now leading voices on immigration and refugee rights and environmentalism and dismantling white supremacy culture. All these things are verses contributed by our tradition to the ongoing powerful play of the human drama. We have verses being contributed today. Our former president, Bill Sinkford, encouraging us to recapture and adopt another reverence of language. Growing, said Unitarian Universalism is growing up, growing out of a cranky and contentious adolescence into a confident maturity. A maturity in which we can not only claim our good news, the values we have found in this free faith, but also begin to offer that good news to the world outside the beautiful sanctuary walls. There is a new willingness on our part to come in from the margins and be maybe, I would say, evangelical. He says, I would like us to see, be better acquainted with the depths, both so that we are more grounded in personal faith and that we can effectively communicate that faith, that what we believe demands of us to communicate it to others. For this, I think, we need to cultivate what Minister David Bumbach calls a vocabulary of reverence. And Sinkford explained that doesn't mean that religious language has to mean God talk. 
and not suggesting that Unitarian Universalism return to completely traditional Christian language, but to return to speaking of the Spirit in language of the Spirit that connects to people. A couple years ago at General Assembly, Nancy McDonald Ladd contributed a great verse to our Unitarian Universalist story when she talked about stopping our fake fights among each other and getting on to the real work before us. She said we need to stop having fake fights about what height the television screen goes and what color to paint a room and all this kind of stuff, right? We need to be about the real fights of the real damage being done in the world around us, to our environmental home, to the rights and freedoms of our brothers and sisters. We don't have time for fake fights anymore. She says, what was challenging to me among my rel liberal religious compatriots was not an analysis of any given situation. Rather, it was the utter certitude with which everyone seemed to hold their ideas. We had found our place on one side or another of every single issue or idea, and we not only avoided the middle of the road, but we also failed to see that there were drivers headed somewhere worthwhile on the other side. What bothered me then and what bothers me still, even about myself, she said, is how very little room I sometimes perceive in the liberal church for acknowledgement of either one's own limitations or the tragic dimension of our days that confound even the very best laid plans of mice and ministers. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you, she said, you might be wrong. It is the question that makes community possible. What a verse to contribute, right? For surely there is a fundamentalism of the left as much as a fundamentalism of the right. When you can broker no other way of seeing things but your own, you excommunicate yourself from community. Every year at General Assembly, our national annual meeting, there's a worship called the Service of the Living Tradition. Has anybody here been to that? It's a powerful service. It became more powerful once I became a minister. Each year on the Thursday night of our national meeting, this service honors and recognizes religious professionals marking career milestones. Ministers who have been fellowshipped and ordained and given what we call first or primary fellowship are recognized. <clears throat> Ministers retiring are recognized. Ministers who have died are recognized. And yes, now they are beginning to include religious educators and other professionals as they go through this every year. But since I'm a minister, it's the minister thing that really grabbed me at this General Assembly a couple years ago. When I noticed something very powerful, as they went through the list of those who had been ordained and those who retired and those who had died, I realized that for the first time, I knew more of those who had retired and died than I did of those being ordained. And I sat there three years ago, a month after my 50th birthday, thinking for the first time, crap, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> but it made me zero in on what my verse would be to the composition of this faith. What can I give? It is a really powerful feeling of security and safety and belonging, not just fitting in, that someday my name and picture is going to be up on that screen when I stop doing this and when I'm not here anymore. And at that time, will anyone know the verse I contributed and be able to sing it a little bit and have it inspire their verse? I hope so. But I want you to think about that too. You are a member of your family. You are a member of this faith family. Everything you do is composing a verse in this powerful play. One of the most powerful things we can do in our personal life and our life of faith is recognize that as we go through our life, 
we are going through the process of turning ourselves into an ancestor. <laughs> Someone who the community remembers and how they sang and what the verse was. We don't even always know when the verse we sang was the lullaby or the song of hope or inspiration or the scream of celebration that someone else needed to hear. We may never know. But it happens. It happens all the time. You are always singing. You are always speaking forth poetry. It is your life. What will your verse be in the middle of all the craziness? A country where people can't talk to each other. A politics leaning increasingly on hate and division. An environment that is collapsing. We can get ourselves down very easily. But Whitman tells us, what amid these? And he says, that you are here. That life exists and identity and the powerful play goes on and you can contribute a verse. If the song is getting discordant, your verse can return us to harmony. The person next to you may pick it up and sing along. You are a powerful actor in the play. Remember to think of yourselves that way. Become an ancestor. Sing a powerful verse. For this is what we are called to do. As the powerful play goes on, we are called to discern what our verse will be.